Hello and welcome to the Direct Spance. I'm Mitch the Quack and I hope you're having less quack day than myself. Today we're going to be talking about battle pets and their relation to lore. I know this may seem like an odd topic considering the myriad of things I could be talking about, but trust me, by the end of this I guarantee you'll start to realise their importance. To start things off I'm going to recall a short anecdote. When I first started speculating, one of the conversations I happened to chime into was a discussion about how Dark Souls-esque World of Warcraft's lore is. To give the briefest explanation of what that means, the Dark Souls franchise basically tells most of its lore through cryptic flavour text, instead of directly telling the player. This generally forces players to infer the story surrounding the Dark Souls universe, however because the hints are so meticulously thought out, if you have a strong knowledge of the basic Dark Souls lore, the flavour text will reveal the rest. Also, for those who don't know what flavour text is, basically it's text specifically added to certain things within a game which give more detail about that thing. The text is usually lore related and directly connected to the icon of the respective item. One of the best examples of flavour text being used in World of Warcraft is the use of it with the Legion legendary weapons. All the weapons had some form of flavour text attached to them. But anyway, this conversation about how important the flavour text in World of Warcraft is, in particularly in relation to the weapons, is going on. From memory, I think I was investigating professions at the time, but for some reason, at that moment, it finally clicked. I realised there was one place in World of Warcraft that goes completely unmatched in the amount of flavour text related to its collectibles. That place, as you've probably already guessed, is the Battle Pet Journal and Battle Pets. All Battle Pets have some form of flavour text. And where some is obviously not important, others are so eye-opening it hurts. I mean, unfortunately, with BFA, the importance of battle pet lore seems to have tapered off considerably. However, I can't really blame Blizz, as almost no one in the lore community pays attention to this stuff. And the reason why I'm willing to say such an arrogant statement is because what I'm about to show you is not the type of lore people ignore. One of the first battle pets that made my eyes bleed with how important its flavour text was is the Gold Beetle. The flavour text reads as follows. Tiny autonomous machines created by the Titans to clean and maintain their mighty edifices. Now, I'm pretty sure you already know why that as a statement in itself is important. Here's the thing though. Similar to Dark Souls, when looking at battle pet flavour text and lore, once you find something that seems relevant, you have to research and infer certain things to gain an understanding of its full importance, and or whether it's not important at all. Whether this be looking at abilities, researching the definition of words, drawing reasonable comparisons within the lore, knowing your lore, or just checking the IRL references, however if you're scrupulous with your assessments, you'll probably find something. For the gold beetle, the big reveal is its location, though before I go any further, if there is anyone watching who has in-depth knowledge about battle pets, I have one question that will either make what I'm about to say next plausible or completely disprove it. That question is, is battle pet locational information usually accurate? As in, would I be right in saying battle pets do not regularly appear outside of the zones they are supposed to appear in? I know it's an odd question, but if there is anyone who has that knowledge, could you please leave an answer in the comments? I would be greatly appreciative. And I will explain why this is important at the end of this theory. Return to the Gold Beetle. The Gold Beetle can be found in the Tyrannus, the Badlands, and Gorgrond. As in Draenor Gorgrond, which is another planet. This battle pet was placed in Gorgrond during Ward, and where at the time you could have easily said it's a typo or someone of Blizzard screwing up the battle pet placements, Three years later, we got Chronicle Volume 2, which confirms the Breaker line of Gorgrond was actually created by the Titans, which, interestingly enough, explains the placement patterns of the Gold Beetle in Gorgrond, which generally lines up with the Breaker sections of Gorgrond. So, just so I'm making this clear, the flavour text of a common battle pet literally confirmed the Titans had been on Draenor, yet it took the release of Chronicle Volume 2 three years later for the realisation to sink in, and if I'm not mistaken, at the time it was still a shock. I mean, I played at the start of WAD and thought I knew the lore, begrudgingly went back and got thoroughly humbled after I realised the amount of universe building lore crammed into each zone. Then I found this, and 
Well, let's just say my ability to physically say or agree with the statement Blizzard doesn't know its law has been severely hampered ever since. And the joke is, what I just pointed out is just the surface stuff. Badlands has Alderman, another Titan facility, strengthening the Titan connection. Then you get Tyrannus, which at first seems like the odd location out. I mean, Aldum is in the vicinity, but the Gold Beetle doesn't turn up in the zone. So is there a Titan facility under Gadget's land, considering that's where the majority of Gold Beetles appear in Tyrannus? Maybe, but that's speculation. Here's a fact. Scarabs are a type of beetle. Now what's funny about that is the in-game Sand Scarab Battle Pet flavor text makes note of saying Wood Warcraft Scarabs are different to beetles. This is however where knowledge of WoW's general law comes in handy. Because all we have to do is apply our knowledge of the Curse of Flesh and its effects to creatures of stone. Couple that with the fact Aldum and the Silithus are the only places Scarab Pets can be obtained in-game and the idea the Breakers experienced a near, if not identical, fate to the Titan Forged when it came to the Curse of Flesh, and what you get is a rather eye-opening revelation. The Scarabs in the Silithus weren't innately Silithid. They were actually more akin to the Anubiseth and Tolvia, and were most likely enslaved creations of the Titans. This would also explain the value behind the Scarab currency in AQ. Oh, and as for their Curse of Flesh equivalents, the Beetle, it really depends on how far you wish to take this theory. I mean, plainly, the Gold Beetle was a Titan creation turned to flesh. However, the question is, do all Beetles indicate possible Titan presences or facilities like Alderman and Gorgrond? I mean, if it's just the Gold variant, then Zoldazar, specifically a Taldazar, thanks to the Golden Beetle, just got reconfirmed as a Titan facility and going by the relevant flavor text, we also get an indication large portions of Troll Society may have worshipped a form of the Titan Forged at some point. However, if it is all Beetles, what's rather ironic is that most of the location Beetle Battle Pets appear already have known and heavy connections to the Titans. If anything, the Beetles just add context to what the Scarabs, prior to the Curse of Flesh, may have been doing in the area. The only places that really stand out are Felwood, North and Southern Stranglethorn, as well as Duratar and Orgrimmar. I'll let you decide how far to take this theory from here, because there is a very interesting implication about the Nerubian Spider Lords here, but at this point I'm hoping I've just made it quite apparent there is relevant lore within Battle Pets. Sticking with the insects, let's talk Ravages. First introduced in the Burning Crusade as these awkwardly four-legged monsters, in WAD, we got to see what they looked like before they were transformed with the destruction of Draenor. And overall, it should have raised some eyebrows. Why? Well, long story short, Ravagers not only look like Silithid, they also have the same life cycle and habits. Ever since WAD, there has been extremely overt hints the Silithid and the Ravagers are the same species and don't just happen to share similar models. And put simply, if that turns out to be true, it heavily indicates at how the Akia were created and the possible origin slash truth behind the Old Gods. And no, that is not an over-exaggeration. Yes, it is a theory I have worked slash am revising, and no, I am not explaining it today, because it would take away from the equally big theory attached to Battle Pets coming later. And once again, that is not over-exaggeration either. Sticking with the Ravagers for now, in BFA, the Battle Pet Journal confirmed Ravagers and Silithid are the same species. The parasitic boar fly flavor text reads as follows. The stinger of a Ravager wasp can cause intense pain for up to three hours. Consult physician immediately if stung. So, the Ravagers of Draenor, the Silithid of the Silithus, and the wasps of Azeroth, which have been related to both, are variations of the same species. Furthermore, the sand stinger wasp connects the Ravagers to bees with this flavor text. It is a well-established fact that wasps produce far higher quality honey than bees, well-established in very, very small circles of wasp farmers. That isn't a joke flavor text, by the way. In Voldoon, we quite literally harvest honey from wasps, and in Pandaria, they are literally used like honeybees by the Pandaren. Other than hopefully establishing the difference between the Scarabs and the Ravagers, even though both are called Silted and AQ, 
I am hoping this once again demonstrates how important battle pet law can be in connecting certain aspects of law that, for the most part, would be considered contested. Now, this is where things get interesting, because when I first started putting this stuff together, I was still rather hesitant. I generally couldn't shake the feeling I was just reading into things too much. Then, I accidentally found this peculiar line of logic, which for me proved battle pet law, or at the very least, early battle pet law, had been intentionally designed to quietly fill in the gaps and hint at the future of WoW's law. So, with certain battle pets, certain things stand out. Crabs and spiders, for example, are two of the most prolific battle pets out there. As in, the amount of variants they have is ridiculous. Another aspect that stands out is the amount of places a battle pet appears. Usually a battle pet will turn up in 1-5 to five locations, with a few exceptions having about 6-8 to eight locations, or on rare occasions, having 9 plus locations. One of the rare 9 plus exceptions is the squirrel, which turns up in 31 locations in game, so you can kind of see why it stood out. The flavour text of the squirrel is also rather peculiar. Most people don't know the difference between a squirrel and chipmunk. Most don't care. It's not a typical question, but for me it seemed like whoever wrote this wanted players to answer the question. So, not knowing the difference between squirrels and chipmunks, I went and did my research. Now, there are a lot of differences between squirrels and chipmunks, and within their respective species there are even more differences. However, one of the biggest differences that stood out for me was how squirrels generally live in trees, while chipmunks generally live underground. Why? Well, there are chipmunks in game, and where they do share the same model as squirrels, that is actually far from the reason why they are so intriguing. What I mean by that is, there are only two battle pets with chipmunk in their name in the entire battle pet journal. And of the two, the red-tailed chipmunk flavor text reads as follows. According to the Tale of the Night Elves, the first red-tailed chipmunk was coloured so after the theft and consumption of a sacred apple. Now, I am going to explain how this relates to the difference between squirrels and chipmunks, but I am hoping at this point the overt reference to the Garden of Eden and the Forbidden Fruit of Knowledge has been noticed. Because, as references go, that's a big one that I personally never expected to be attributed to battle pets. Here's the kicker though. One of the most common knowledge pieces of lore that has been circulating in World of Warcraft for ages is the idea that the Elves came from the Nocturnal and Subterranean Dark Trolls. And if you're a bit lost on where this is going, think about how we used the fruit of the Arkandor, fruit literally empowered with arcane magic, to turn the Night Fallen into Nightborn, and granted them greater access to what could be easily called quote-unquote arcane knowledge slash power. If what I've been talking about just clicked, yeah, I know, my jaw dropped when I first put this together as well. If you assume squirrels and chipmunks are being used as metaphors for the early trolls, the squirrels being the trolls that lived above ground, explain the grisly squirrel flavor text, while the chipmunks are the dark trolls that lived underground, explaining the alpine chipmunk flavor text, then the tale of the red-tailed chipmunk, a specifically night elven story, fits almost perfectly with the transformative effects of the Arkandor's fruit that we see in Suramar. The implication here is the story of the red-tailed chipmunk is directly related to how the dark trolls turn into elves, and where I know exposure to the Well of Eternity is specifically attributed to the trolls' transformation into elves, Think about the Arkwine the Nightborn had cultivated with arcane magic alone for 10,000 years, with no sunlight and the fact there used to be many Arkandors. It's highly likely the fruit from the Arkandors was the final piece that sealed the transformation of the Dark Trolls into Elves. But I also want to make this crystal clear. Battle Pets were introduced in Mist of Pandaria, four years before the Suramar campaign came along, which provided the rest of this context. So if you ever have to convince someone Blizzard does think about its lore at least two expansions in advance, show them this. I find it shockingly convincing, and what's scary is there is still possibilities and lore behind this that haven't been paid off yet. How so? Well, you know how I mentioned this story seems to be a Garden of Eden reference? Here's a question for you. If that interpretation is correct, who's Adam and who's Eve? Or more importantly, 
who's the serpent and who's God. Because what's funny about this theory is it's the only other line of law outside of Chronicle I've found that connects Elune to Yasharaj. For a brief synopsis, Yasharaj was pulled out of Azeroth by Amonthul. The sky left behind was the Well of Eternity. To this day, one of the oddest pieces of lore attributed to the Well of Eternity has been the idea that Elun sleeps under the well during the day. This reference to the Garden of Eden makes the connection, as the Arkandors are specifically described to have been created under the light of the moon, which in one aspect can attribute Elun to God in this analogy. However, as eating the fruit turned the trolls into elves, there is also the very real possibility Elun is the snake that convinced the elves to eat the fruit which, yes, does imply Elune could have been Yasharaj, or at the very least, could have a very strong connection to the Old God. And if you then consider the Azhar raid encounter, the connection gets even stronger. What am I talking about? Well, as I'll always maintain, all raids contain important lore, and obviously the lore to come out of the Eternal Palace has been important. There are, however, a few things that make little to no sense in relation to the Eternal Palace. One of those things is the Cursed Lovers stage of the Azara fight. Now I know this is a sweeping statement, but I am serious. If you look through all of the phase encounter names for each raid boss in the Dungeon Journal, they all make sense in relation to the boss. If you can think of one that doesn't within the context of a raid, please leave a comment, because I almost guarantee you it's not by accident. But anyway. Cursed Lovers as a name and a concept in relation to the Eternal Palace does not make sense at all. I mean, I know it's made clear Azara likes theatrics, but this is seriously a situation where Blizzard could have picked any type of theatrical notion, hell, even a more relevant theatrical notion to what we were doing. Yet, they chose the Cursed Lovers. When you consider what we know about Nazoth, Azara, the Old Gods, and Azara's reign, it is a very, very odd choice. There are like three references in all of World of Warcraft's lore of love being a contributing factor to anything when it comes to characters and entities this powerful. But anyway, the Cursed Lovers as a choice only starts to make sense when you decide to apply the Adam and Eve story, as the idea of the Cursed Lovers can be applied to them depending on what variations of the tale that you look at. But what's even more compelling is what happens when you realise what constellations Adam and Eve are attributed to. Adam is related to the constellation Brutez, which just happens to be one of the constellations on the forges of Alduar. As for Eve, she is represented by Virgo, a constellation that has many interpretations, however most generally depict anything related to Virgo as a woman with angelic wings. Spirit Hills anyone? What's also rather interesting is the serpent is represented by the constellation Hydra. I mean, depending on how literally you take the title God of Seven Heads, the constellation fits surprisingly well. And even if it doesn't, the Ulduar Forges also have the constellation Draco plastered on them. So it's not like there isn't a substitute. Also, if you want to make things more interesting, and assume Elune is more connected to Eve than God or the serpent, then it just happens one of those rare occasions of love in World of Warcraft rears its head. How? Well, one of the Torah mythology stories describes the creation of Scenarius and the meeting between Elune and Malorn. In this theory, the moon is described as being lonely, but it's never explained why Elune is lonely. The only other reference we have to indicate why is the idea Elune was one of the Eyes of Azeroth and was separated from the sun. Now, skipping over to Greek mythology for a bit, depending on what story you're looking at, Artemis is considered to be the god of the moon, and to be frank, she seems to have been the inspiration of the Mother Moon aspect of Loon, which led to the creation of the Sisterhood of Loon and eventually the Nine Elven Sentinels. Now, one of the more well-known stories that relates to Artemis is the story of Orion. Now, once again, depending on what story you look at, the circumstances within the story change. However, one of the more well-known versions of this story is the notion Artemis and Orion fell in love. Well, similar to Adam and Boutez, the constellation of Orion can also be found on the forges of Ulduar. What's truly compelling about this theory is the constellation of Orion is also known as Mirga, or to translate, the deer. Bringing this all together, one of the options in relation to this theory is the notion Elune had an Adam equivalent in World of Warcraft. 
possibly the sun or possibly something else. Assumedly, something happened that forced them to separate and remain separated. Whether this was a good thing or not is yet to be seen, though it probably has something to do with a curse and the serpent equivalent in World of Warcraft. Though, for those who know of Lilith and her IRL connection to Adam and Eve, it just happens when looking at astrology and constellations, Lilith is represented by the Black Moon. But sticking with the Loon being the Eve equivalent, this separation leads to Loon being alone, until Aparo, Malorn, Mirga, Orion got quote unquote caught in the stars, and Loon made the bargain to be loved. Oh, and here's the real kicker for all of this. The child, a demigod some would claim was born into the shadowed forests of the night. He would be called Cenarius, and walk the starry path between the waking world and the kingdom of the heavens. You know how Cenarius ended up in Ardenwald when he was killed? That should make a lot of sense now, especially when you consider how Ardenwald looks. Not forgetting to mention, the Arkandors just happened to be in Suramar, the one place on Azeroth that is extremely reminiscent of Ardenwald, and the idea you can connect Eve to the constellation Virgo, whose representation just happened to be similar to the Spirit Healers, which is intriguing considering Stormheim and Bastion's overt connections to each other through the Halls of Valor. And just to be clear, you can get all of this speculation from one battle pet. By now I hope I have proven why battle pet lore is so important, and how it can open possibilities to finding, exploring, and explaining large pieces of important lore and or relevant lore in World of Warcraft. I personally haven't had the chance to look through all of the battle pets and their flavor texts, however it is something I plan to do as I am certain there is more lore hidden within, and it is something I would suggest doing yourself every now and then if you are interested in lore. You might be surprised by what you find. Also. The reason I asked about the location of battle pets and their accuracy is in Azuna I stumbled across a very odd place. Just west of the Rune Sanctum and north of the Garden of Loon, there is this location called the Olvian Vale. The place is full of Vale Runners, Prowlers and Red Crested Herons and initially it didn't really pique my interest. Then I noticed something that was rather odd. The location has Grey Moths and Bandicoon battle pets located in the area neither of which is supposed to appear in Azuna, according to the Battle Pet Journal. So I am curious, is this a one-off situation, which may make the area important, or does this happen regularly, as yes, it would greatly affect the credibility of this theory. Thank you for watching, and have a nice day.